Um, so you know, my, my feeling is something like, um, that, frankly, there's an invitation, right? The, the name of the event is Emerge, I think, not Emergence or Emergent, but Emerge. Yes. And that invokes certain notions and possibilities and requirements. Um, and I feel like there is a, an affirmative desire for it to have a characteristic of being, in some sense, self-organizing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> like the, the, the sense I have of that, that notion is that we often get stuck in something like halfway, we meaning humans. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're decent at, at organizing things that we already understand, like, you know, conferences and symposia and colloquia, all kinds of good words that were, you know, invented by people well before us and then that do certain things. Um, and then we've definitely tried our hand at a new kind of thing, right? The sense that, that, uh, that all those other things are good for certain intents, but for emergence in particular, they're not. Mm -hmm. um, they're okay, but they're, not, they're not, not optimal. And so we've been trying to figure out how to do this other thing. But we're kind of stuck in kind of a 1.5, not a, not a two, full two, second version two. And um, you know, th they can either end up being more or less of kind one, but with a slightly different aesthetic. Or they can be kind of a shit show where people are milling about, not really knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. um, or they can be self-consciously an experiment, which is you know, in and of itself quite nice. And my sense is we kind of like to avoid all three. Or to the maximum extent possible, we'd like to figure out how to, how to deliver as much as we can get out of this thing. And there's a lot of people who are coming. And my sense is actually a lot of people who are coming are a little bit, I wouldn't say reluctant, but a little bit confused. And maybe even reluctant. I guess I'm reluctant. So if anybody else is reluctant, you know, you're with me. Um, of a, ah, man, I've been to a lot of things. Lots. Too many. Yeah. yeah. And... Shit's real. Like we're, we're there's, there's not a whole lot of time right now to kind of be just sort of dorking around. We got to get, we got to get going cleanly. And yet at the same time, it's quite clear. We don't know exactly how to. So as I was contemplating it, <clears throat> one of the instruments or institutions um, that came to the foreground for me was Dialogos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To the degree to which there's a, a capacity to spend as much time in Dialogos as, as possible in this context, uh, my sense is that would be very good, like as, a, as just a baseline simplicity. All right, we're in Dialogos, we're, we're kind of got good chunks of stuff in place that is supporting what we're trying to do in, in maybe a better, one of the better ways that we know how right now. Mm -hmm. So my, and my sense of it is in the context of Dialogos, it's always best in that sort of union of the first person and the third person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we should be both doing it and talk of participatory as well as um, propositional and perspectival. Right, right, of course. Um, so, and it occurred to me that you and I had not chatted in a while. So it felt like a very nice possibility. Yes. As people who are interested in this topic, we're going to be attending the event in, in some sense and have spent a meaningful amount of time both in and exploring the notion of Eologos. Um, perhaps that would be a, an entree or a gift. And my, my intent would be to record this and then to, to share it and perhaps to actually specifically point um, those different groups, like the organizers or the people who are stewarding or just the people who are going to this event towards it, if they feel like they'd like to um, spend their time on it, uh, if it's useful. And maybe it isn't. Maybe it turns out we come to the end and we're like, well, what a waste of time, in which case we would definitely steer people away. <laughs> um. That's good, and 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 then we could also use this as a platform for. Uh, I'm, so, Guy Guy and Daniel Zaruba have been doing it at Wits. Um, David recorded Johannes Niederhauser and I going through a dialectic into Dialogos. Um, maybe I, we could get a hold of that in some fashion. Um, mm -hmm. We've got several examples. Um, so, I think the proposal is excellent. Um, I'm very reluctant to go, but uh, that's about my idiosyncratic social phobia. Uh, even though there'll be a lot of people there that I know, uh, the thought of going by myself and uh, landing there, and I'll, I won't land when everybody else 
says I'll be late and they'll be weird. And um, that uh, I had to sort of like, mm, I, 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 I really should go. Uh, there are a lot of people are uh, expecting to be able to talk to me there. So um, we'll I, make, get we'll the, sure I get the we walk in. We, we, we'll make sure that when you walk in, we'll all stop talking. We'll all sort of look at you and judge you. <laughs> Whisper, whisper, yeah, whisper a yeah. point, whisper a point. Yeah, that 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 that's the nightmare. <laughs> uh, but 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 I think yeah, I think the uh, I would hope um, that um, there would be a lot of breaking into uh, small. I mean, small groups. It, it, something like an inter, uh, an integration of Dialogos and what Nora Bateson does with her warm data, where you have groups in Dialogos and then one person goes to another group and people move around. And they they they're in a, a small group for a while. And then they, the groups reconfigure, so there's semination between the groups and and things like that. Um, I think right. that would be a very good way to try and facilitate the kind of emergence. Uh, I know there are are some actual presentations. I think that's to give sort of a, a bit of a, a structure to it. But I think doing a lot of this um, is very important. Now the the, the, the difficulty we're going to face is we're getting a lot of primates that haven't been together physically. Right. And they're going to they're gonna want to do a lot of social grooming. And, and rightly so, by the way, rightly so. I'm not criticizing that. So a lot of what people are going to want to do is initially um, uh, sort of just hang out and be with each other kind of thing. And um, again, I, I totally get that. But um, your point is well taken. And this is a very limited amount of time. Uh, and it's a golden opportunity. We have a lot of people that are typically not all together going to be together. So yeah, getting people into, um, to, to, to consider getting into Dialogos, I think would be a really excellent idea. Nice, so you brought forth a lot of, a lot of I think, key elements to, of consideration. Um, a couple of, maybe I'll sort of recapitulate my sense of what I heard. Um, and then I just put in a few that, um, maybe higher order principle. So one would be something like, what is actually proper for us to hope for? Mm, yes. And, 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 and in that, I'm, what I'm noticing is something like, for me at least, if I have an expectation and I notice that expectation isn't happening, not only does the expectation not happen, but I also am not able to realize what is possible. I get frustrated and stuck. Right. So that feels like a double, a double consideration. One might be, can we do what we can to orient ourselves towards what is in fact a reasonable hope um, so that we're most likely to realize it and also orient ourselves towards what is a quite reasonable disposition that allows for the highest possibility to dot, 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 emerge, okay? Mm -hmm. So that seems like the interesting, right? There's a dynamic there between something like what's the proper relationship of our our imaginal capacity to support emergence and the real lived experience of how to flow with what is in fact actually emerging. You know, it's like the difference between the scaffold and the, mm, and, the, well and, the and, and the architecture, something like that. Um, yeah, so for example, this came up for me very strongly when I was talking with some of the other folks earlier in a different period of time, presentation a presentation and it feels like it's really nice i think well i'll put it this way this is my my sense of it like my my diagnosis of what happens when you have a uh, a presentation formally so you have a a group of people who are gathered in a space so usually a room or a hall all more or less facing the same direction oftentimes in, a, in an obligatory way i.e there's a structure both normative and physical, a bunch of chairs that are all facing the same way and a basic vibe that if you're not facing the same way as everybody else, you're doing something wrong. And they're pointing their attention at some given um, person, which may in fact be many specific bodies, right? maybe a panel, maybe a given person, which has a symbolic characteristic, raised podium, chair, something like that. And, and there's a, a, a normative and practical uh, construct that there is a subject, some topic bound by the, um, those who are on the, on, the, on the stage in the front um, and that everyone should give their full attention to that individual or, or group of people, that mm -hmm. being, that person, 
uh, and the subject that arises. Um, and then, of course, we have the very interesting characteristic of the relationship between the one who's in the front and the ones who are in the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, that the key message is, in fact, the topology. The key message is that's the thing we do. That's the thing humans do, particularly modern people, the blue church in particular, as I, as I, particularly, as I describe it. Like yeah. a, a signature move of the blue church is that structure. Uh, asymmetric relationship of a broadcast modality. And notice that there's an intrinsic at the human level, the homo sapiens level, that it, it creates a pecking order. Whoever is getting a lot of attention must be important. They are, we are, our system is orienting ordinary sapien prestige and our underlying systemic dynamic of, a, of, of, of who should be getting attention is being hijacked by creating a formal structure that by virtue of us all giving them attention, they must be the ones who deserve attention. So it creates a really interesting feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, what that does is it creates a, a, a sort of a super salience, whatever happens to be coming out of that at that point, right? Whatever happens to be coming out of that mouth is given super salience, although it may, in fact, be not relevant. Now, this also creates an interesting felt sense in the body, because my body is in this room. My mind is in a very odd place, right? It may actually be attending very different things, because that's not necessarily, I don't necessarily care about what's being said. For example, maybe I was in a conversation moments ago that actually has a lot more relevance to me right now. Or maybe the, what I'm hearing is actually very poorly done. Who knows? Or it's awesome, but it's not relevant to me, but I'm still in this fucking room. So my body's here. My mind is in a very odd place. And then my soul, which, which cares no whit for the formal structure that I've been obligated to get into, is wherever it in fact needs to be. And if my soul isn't in the room, that's a real interesting problem. Because now what I'm being taught is that there's a relationship between my body, my mind, and the soul, which is characterized by lack of integrity. Right? What I would propose first and foremost is the two degree which we find ourselves gathered in such a place, we maybe explore what I just said and notice, hmm, there's something about that that's actually really interesting. And it's a piece of what we've come from. Right? It's a piece of the past. We've all been part of that. Even at the very minimum, it's just the notion of school. Right? A school room is that structure. And the legacy of that, of that is much... Most of what we need to undo is the legacy of that, the separation of body, mind, and soul. And the, and the use, by the way, of mind's rationalization function, well, I, there must be a good reason for this, to reify that separation in our daily life, which creates all kinds of, how do I say, handholds for institutions that aren't necessarily operating in our, with our best interests in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and then the thing I, would, I, would, I will personally be prosecuting, and I'm not necessarily promoting this, this is my own uh, uh, kind of coyote energy. I will be endeavoring to ground myself in wherever my soul happens to be. Mm. My soul says, mm, outside in the hallway, uh, sitting, facing the wall is where you need to be. Mm, I think I'll do that. <laughs> and I'll explore, right, with, with care, what's, what's happening here in the context of the higher. Right? I'm not doing this to be a dick. I'm doing it because I'm signing up for something. And my sense is I'm signing up for something that is grounded in a call for an emergence. And we're endeavoring simultaneously to support that which wants to emerge and also to explore emergence itself. Right? This is an interesting kind of self-referential thing. And so my commitment is that I will be in support of that which wants to emerge. And I'll be exploring the sensibility of what does it mean to truly support that which wants to emerge. And part of that, for me at least, is going to be exploring the difference between our habits individually and uh, normatively, institutionally, and what is in fact maybe our, our deeper capacity. So I, it would be helpful if you unpacked for me, although we've talked about this before, but let's bring it in so it's alive again, what you're referring to when you're using the term soul. Ah, nice. Um, and in fact, what I might do is I might actually use a different term because I was talking with Zach, like as is usually the case in our calls, right before this call. Yes. Um, although he's in a different context now, so it's actually not directly before this call, it's an hour before. Um, and he's been working with the triad of sapience, sentience, and intelligence. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's just a very close mapping. It's like, it's similar. The notion of sapience as he's using it and the notion of soul as I just use it, it's pointing to more or less the same thing. And I am certainly not a scholar of that notion. I don't have a lot of legacy in the use of soul. So I'm not trying to be particularly formal. So I'm happy to use a different term. So what do I mean? Now, this is a really powerful question. And I love to enter into it if you don't mind. I think it's 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 potent and worth worth attending to. That's what I'd like to do. 
Um, so one aspect or one characteristic is it is in fact precisely the faculty or aspect that is proper for exploring emergence. Hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. first. I mean that both descriptively and prescriptively. Okay. Um, it's very connected to the, the notion of relevance in relationship to salience. Yes. So it has to do with notions of connectivity, continuity, wholeness, wholesomeness. Uh, if I think of myself from the point of view of being part of something that is larger than myself, mm -hmm. the aspect of me that is in fact in continuity with whole, with wholeness, that's going in the direction of sapience or soul. Okay. And then I would also want to bring in the relationship of, of intelligence and sentience. And that, by the way, Zach, to the degree to which you are aware of what I'm doing, and I'm making a hash of your much more considered distinctions, I apologize. I simply invoke your, you're doing this more fully and better than me. I actually said it in the conversation. I said, man, Zach, this is way above my pay grade. So thank you. And I hope you do a good job, but I, it's, uh, I will be using it, but I'm not sure that I can actually use it um, at the mastery level. I can't take ownership or proper, proper relationship with it. Intelligence, I think, is some sense, some sense easy. We've got a good handle on that. Like we're talking about something that is uh, oriented towards the algorithmic sliding of control structures that have certain capacities to enable us to navigate the reality we're in relationship with from the point of view that we understand it. Mm -hmm. so it's sort of semantics, concepts, um, logical relationships, um, using tools that we have access to in ways that we understand how to use them in a fashion that is effective and efficient. So it's oriented towards things like efficiency mm -hmm. um, and exploring a particular space of possibility and breaking it up into prefigured characteristics that are oriented towards things like doing jobs well. Right? So it's that kind of thing. The word algorithm, right? Orderly rules for accomplishing objectives, very purposeful, oriented towards purpose, in fact. And then sentience is a, a little slipperier. Sentience is something like, like awareness per se. Sentience is something like, hmm. yeah, it's funny. And in a moment, I'm gonna simply like beautiful with humility, step into away from the center and open up the center because people like you and Greg and Zach, this is your shtick and you're good at it. Um, so I'm kind of like playing the role of uh, God straight man here. I'll just sort of stumble into it and then you can do the good, good the good work. Um, all right, sentience, awareness. What I'm no noticing in the context of sentience is actually relationship with possibility. Um, you know, it's the, it's the, the thing that is, the space in which insight happens. Um, it's the field um, that is oriented towards things like innovation. Uh, ah, like if I think about the notion of sense making, uh, intelligence is the functional capacity to create and utter well formed sentences. Sentience is the space in which the pre linguistic, pre-semantic um, is able to settle and orient itself in the directionality of what is good sense, um, whole mind, things like that. Uh, and then sapience is in fact the ground, right? the, the whole context, the relationality and the orienting basis of billions of years of evolution, which is able to solve a bunch of problems of directing, right? It's actually what helps orient it's what simplifies the problematic space of sense-making by creating a structure that is actually able to say, this is the direction of rightness. And, uh, uh, and there's a whole bunch of, that's immediately imported in what I just said. And I'm happy to be a, uh, a defender of that if necessary. Well, I don't know if I'm going to require you to make a defense. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I've been talking with Zach for a while as well, and I have similar kinds of taxonomies. Um, let me try saying what I think these are, and, and but put it into conversation with what you've said. So I think 
uh, I'll start with sentience, because uh, I think there are a lot of sentient beings that aren't, uh, we, we certainly wouldn't want to attribute sapience to them. Um, but um, you're, the, the idea that it's connected somehow with awareness and creating the field, uh, that's how I primarily think of sentience. And so uh, I get my notion from the book written by Mason entitled Sentience, uh, a classic book in which he was trying to understand what sentience is. Um, and you'll see, of course, there's a theme of relevance realization running through all of these, hmm. uh, which I think is what this, what I think this is, that's what binds them together as a continuum. But uh, sentience is, I think, what is going on properly in perspectival knowing, and that is, he defines sentience as the act of sizing up. Hmm. So what, what, you're, what we're doing in sentience is we, and this is a dynamical system. So I'm not talking about in sequence, I'm talking about components that have mutual feedback relationships with each other. But first of all, we're creating features and then we're foregrounding some of the features, backgrounding some of the features. The foregrounded figures are, uh, features are being configured. And then around that configuration, there are possibilities, there are affordances for the framing of problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's what in sentience I'm doing, in, in, in sentience I'm doing this, uh, the, the, this recursive, uh, uh, you, you know, um, relevance realization in that the features, uh, the featureization is feeding up into the foregrounding and the backgrounding, but the backgrounding and the foregrounding is also top down affecting which features are being chosen as features. Yep. And, and, and the, the foregrounding and the background are affecting what's being configured and what's being configured affects. And so you have to think of it as this multiply complex dynamical system of sizing up salience yeah. landscaping. And yeah. I think that's what sentience is. I sent sentience is what the field that is created by sentience is the field of the obviousness of what is available as affordance and what can be done as action. Hmm. Yeah. Hold on. Let me slide that down a little bit. Right. Yeah, I'm like running a uh, sort of a, a Terminator 2 visual field. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 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 right, it's actually, it's, it, it's very specifically doing that, right? It's taking the, the undifferentiated sensorium and it's actually layering on something like um, structure, uh in the context of you know how am i about to navigate this environment excellent and so mateson talks about the sort of primary action of sentience is noticing mm, the way yeah. we just talked about it right he actually prefers the greek word noesis um which i think is right in one sense and problematic in another but uh -huh. i for me, that's what I take what we're talking about when we're talking about sentience. Um, nice. When we move to intelligence, and there's a continuum between these, right? There, there, there isn't a, there is, they aren't dichotomous units. There's a continuum of recursive processing going on. What I take intelligence to be is within the field of obviousness is our capacity for being a problem solver. That's how we measure intelligence. Mm -hmm. What's your capacity for being a general problem solver? And for me, that's where we now move into a lot of the work I do about problem formulation and problem framing, that the proper action of intelligence is, and I think you captured this, but this is how I would put it, is turning ill-defined problems into well-defined problems. That's what intelligence does for us. It takes combinatorially explosive problem spaces that are ill-defined usually and collapses them into finite and well-defined problems. So a more intelligent person can go into a relatively messier environment and formulate it in such a way that there is a clear course of action that has a good chance of achieving their goals. Right, right. Yeah, the visual image I have here is, uh the scene from Sherlock Holmes with Robert Downey Jr. Where he's in, he's in yes. the fight, the brawl. Yes, exactly, exactly. And he lays it all out. Yeah. Stop the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 
he's got the search space of all the possible things he's been doing and he's got the foresight and he's doing all that stuff that is the hallmark of general intelligence so sapience is i mean it, it's wisdom and um i tend to think of wisdom having a very specific function um two sides um i i put I have an intervening variable of rationality, and I don't mean by that uh, logicality. I think rationality has to do with the proper proportioning of your intelligence. Um, so mm. one way of thinking about it is uh, you we all fall prey as we pursue sentience and intelligence, we fall prey to self-deception. We are perpetually vulnerable to it. And we also, and, and that's largely because, and you said this, relevance and, and salience, we are making salient things that are not actually relevant to solving our problems. Mm -hmm. I think that's the core. I think the core of self-deception is a kind of fundamental misapprehension of the significance of what we have framed in our problems and what we have sized up in our situations. Mm -hmm. So we've sized up the situation we formulated a problem, we've made these things salient, but they're not actually the things that are relevant to getting us to, to thread through the needle and uh, find the solution. So wisdom has within it um, the capacity for self-correction and self-transcendence. And those are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. And so a, a wise person is somebody who properly grasps the significance of both how problems have been framed or misframed and how situations have been sized up or misapprehended. Right. And therefore, right. they can afford emergence by either taking us deeper into the realization of the properly apprehended significance or reconfiguring things so we reappreciate and recognize, I'm playing with that word, what is actually relevant to both the problems we're facing and the situation is at hand. That's okay, how nice. I would try to do it. Nice. So, yeah, I want to I, I want to slow down and zoom in on some of the pieces there. So, in this case, unfortunately, I don't have a popular movie, but the in the image that I had of it probably feels like very Woody Allen. Actually, the image that I have is that, that we live in a world. Oh, actually, no. Remember um, what was that movie about the with, with Bondo, the, the world where everybody's really dumb in the future. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that one. It's called Idiocracy. Oh, uh, right. 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 And so everybody right. has, there's a, there's a shared ideology that this beverage which is basically like, like high fructose Gatorade is right. the best possible beverage. And so they're, you know, they're pouring it on the plants. Yeah, yeah, because it's the best possible beverage. Obviously, it makes sense. And our character, right. who's been teleported from the past, looks at it and sees all the plants, are and says, "Maybe yeah. it's not so good for the plants, but the you know our our, our uh, context, our, our idiocracy, stuck in simply intelligence, isn't able to access the simplicity of wisdom, which does something like, have you considered just looking at the plants? That kind of an idea. Yes, yeah. right." Yes. So yes. The, the image is coming to me is actually one of a door. So you know, we, we maybe live in some weird world where we've been taught that uh, like the proper way to, to open doors is you walk up to them and stand and they slide open. Um, and somebody walks up to the door and it doesn't open. Like, oh, what do I do? They just stand there, right? They just keep going back and forth, repeating the same construct, moving back and forth. Somebody else looks at the door and says, hmm, well, what if I just open it? And they walk in, right? something like that. Like, that's the thing. So it's that ability, as you say, the ability to have a relationship with what is separate from the frames that we're deploying to be able to navigate what is so that we can actually be very specifically able to be aware of when our frames are not functional. And so that's a, that's a piece of it, right? The ability to sort of be in relationship in a very different fashion, a modally distinct fashion. And wisdom is not intelligence. That's one part of the whole point of it. It's a different kind of thing. So it lets us to have a relationship with how do we navigate reality in a different mode. And because it's a different mode, it's not going to get stuck in the same stuff as the other mode. And you need to have that as a, fun, a basic function. 
Yeah, I think a way of putting that is intelligence addresses our defect of ignorance, but wisdom addresses our defect of foolishness. And therefore, there are different projects. And you need different practices and different virtues and, and skills in order to address them. I noticed that I have not had enough Johnny V in my in my life over the past. <laughs> well, that's a very kind thing to say. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> that was a very sweet. Uh, what was it? The sweet science? That was a sweet turn of phrase. OK, so let's go there for a little bit. So a relationship, sapience, wisdom, soul. Hmm. I like that a little bit just to play with that, because the word soul invokes things like, you know, in music to have soul, like something like to have lived life richly, deeply, to have suffered life. So you can grasp the significance of the music, yeah. not just have the sentience or even the intelligence about it. Oh, right? he, he, yeah. talks, he talks about this, grasping the significance. This is the, this is the distinguishing difference between understanding and knowledge. Knowledge is you grasp the evidence for things. Understanding is you grasp the significance of your knowledge. Uh -huh. Those aren't the same thing. Those aren't the same thing. Um, and, and so, so having soul is, I really grasp the significance for this. And that means it has a transformative potential for me above and beyond having no, just the knowledge of the music. Right, right. That's what I, that's what I take soul to mean when people, when people are invoking it. Yeah, and, and you can you can begin to do the the tracing, like all the other characteristics of when people speak to it. Like I was speaking at the notion of continuity, connectedness. You know, significance yes. has to do with the significance of something has to do with the fact connectedness, connectedness to the whole. To the whole. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so this goes back to the religious notion of the soul, right? Which was the soul was that part of you that is able to respond to the reality of God, if we're taking it in sort of a Judeo-Christian sense of the word soul, which, which is which is its proper home. Uh, there's analogous things perhaps in the notion of Atman, but when we're talking, when we're invoking the word soul, we at least should do due diligence with respect to uh, the Abrahamic heritage that that term comes from. Mm -hmm. And what it meant was our capacity ultimately to respond to God was to grasp the significant of what was most ultimately real. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And this, this is, again, if we, if we simplify for just a moment, this is, this is why that door came up for me, about the, the image of the door. Simplify for just a moment, right? The premise, <laughs> it's kind of funny that we have to even make this as a premise. The premise that there actually is a real door. Yeah. Like, and it works in a real way. And I have a model of it, which is what my intelligence is working with. But, you know, the map's not the territory. The premise is there's a fucking territory. And I can be in a relationship with the territory if I kind of need to. And then, and then I can use, instrumentally, I can use maps to support me in navigating the territory. But I got to be very clear, very careful. If the map says there's a bridge between these two um, uh, pieces of land over the great chasm, but my experience of reality is telling me there is no bridge. It's a very wise choice not to step out over the, over the empty space. Um, and of course, the inverse, which is, of course, the Cohen. If I really, really know that there is a bridge, but I can't quite make sense of how that could be because my eye sees no bridge, now I'm, we're in a different do domain, right? And so this, is, this, goes, this goes to the notion of, uh, how do I say, like subtlety and wholeness of perception, right? This is another piece, right? The, that mode of, of sapience is more able to have access to my whole sensorium, my wholeness of perception. Um, and that's another piece. So, I mean, let's use the door, let's use the door's uh, image to pick up on that. I'm going to move. I'm going to on my end that you're you're breaking up a lot, and if it's on my end, I'm going to try to fix it to see if this is better. Things are fine for me. My signal seems clean here. Yeah. All right. So we were just. Uh, I want to play with the door. The parable of the door. Yeah. And of course, it's a Christian parable. You know, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Hmm. Uh, I didn't know that. I have very little history of Christian uh, liturgy. Christianity. Uh, Jesus calls himself the door. 
Um, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and so, and one of the one of the uh, McGee and Barber's work on wisdom is wisdom is the ability to see through illusion and into reality. A broader and better way of putting that is wisdom is a way. It, wisdom is the ability to properly relate appearance to reality. That's how I would put it a little bit more broadly. Um, it's not always seen through illusion. Uh, that's overcoming the foolishness, but it's also generating connection by seeing uh, the proper relationship between appearance and reality. This to me is Plato, Plato through and through. Now, putting it in the Christian context, what I got when you were talking about this was the wise person is the person who can see through the door before it's open. He can hear beyond and he can get some sense of an unseen space beyond the current enclosure into which movement is possible so a, a person think about be, think of your the room as your frame the wise person is the person who has cultivated that sensibility that they sense but there's something beyond the frame i should be looking for the door i should and there's there's something that the door can open into they have a capacity for insight, for transframing, for not only moving things around. So let's say an insight is just, I reframe within my space, but this is actually transframing. This is, no, 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 I want to, I, I want to move you to a bigger space that is as of yet unseen to you. And so there is, this is something I was talking to Jonathan Pajot about recently, there's an inherently, and I want to use this term very carefully, there's an inherently symbolic aspect to sapience. And what I mean by a symbol is precisely this, something that can enter your frame and you can, it, it, it's, it's capable of being taken into your frame, even being appreciated, but it's, it doesn't quite sit or stay within the frame. It calls you like through a portal to a wider frame. And so um, and of course, Jesus is doing this with his parables. The parables sound like stories within your frame and you take them in. And then once they're inside your head, they explode open and they burst you beyond the frame you're in. There, there's the, right? And so there's an inherently symbolic aspect in this sense of sapience. Okay, nice. Okay. So now let's go back to the beginning. We're invoking and inviting emergence yes emergence what is it well we can say it's not what is it's new yes by definition whatever frames we have cannot be the proper frames to do with that which is emergent yes by definition therefore intelligence is not the proper faculty for being in relationship with that which is emergent yes okay so we need to ground ourselves in the proper faculty in some sense as simple as that and if you're going to be going to a, a gunfight, you best bring the right tool. Yes. You do a gunfight. All right. What is that faculty? We're talking about it. Wisdom, sapience, soul, grounding in that. Intelligence has a role to play, but it's not the foreground. Mm -hmm. In this case, probably it'll be used for things like getting into the hotel and scheduling lunch. Yes, mostly. very much. Mostly. Yes. Uh, maybe remembering people's names and remembering that you can use things like cell phones to take pictures of people so you know who they are. <laughs> it's shit like that. <laughs> Definitely not the deep stuff. And the deep stuff, we're going to be needing to be grounding in this other faculty, which has these nice names, because that's the proper faculty for that which is not yet here. And we're going to be doing something even more. We're not just going to be in relationship with emergence. We're audaciously endeavoring to actually nurture and support emergence. Oh, well, ah, okay, nice. So we have, a, there's a saving grace. This is definitely not our first rodeo. As nice a, choice of terms, by the way, saving yeah. grace. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and just allow the notion that, so, that, that something either, you know, pick your poison is going to be dropping all kinds of cool symbolic hints in this narrative. Um, I think the infinite uh, significance is a nice point. You're, you're exemplifying the very soul that we're talking about. Hmm. Jeez. Okay. So let's see. Whew. Ah, not our first rodeo. Yes. In fact, we've been doing this a lot. Homo sapiens. Honestly, we even take our we take pride in it. We're Homo sapiens. We really say, "Hey, guess what? We're the sapient ones. Yeah, yes, All the rest yes. of these animals, they're like whatever. We're the sapiens." Okay. 
That's our shtick. Our shtick is sapiens. <laughs> so good news. To the degree to which you are just doing the homo sapien thing properly, then we'll be able to be in relationship with emergence. But, what is, that? but what is that? I want to stop here because like you, we have a, the, at least the beginnings of a preliminary answer that in the upper paleolithic transition, mm. what is it that called us out and distinguished us, us from other the Neanderthals were, were presumably, we have very good evidence that they are as deeply, perhaps more intelligent than us in some very significant ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what is it? Uh -huh. And of course, there isn't a clean, I, 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 I don't want to be taken to task. There isn't a clean line between us and the Neanderthals. There's overlap, there's interbreeding. So I'm talking about a question of emphasis, not of exclusivity. Okay, but what you see in the upper Paleolithic transition? Well, you see that people are turning walls into portals. That's literally what the cave paintings are, right? The, 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 uh, I think Lewis Williams is correct. The, 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 the walls of the caves were regarded as membranes. They weren't regarded as barriers. They were you saw through, so the carvings of the animals make use of the topography of the cave and the flickering of the flames so the animals would seem to be moving across the surface mm. of the cave and, 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 and things like this. And, and then, you, you, of course, you, you're, there's all the touching of the cave wall. Um, and you get the emergence of art, you get the emergence of what looks like altered states of consciousness, a sense of transcendence, you go through all this um, sensory deprivation, climbing down in the darkness. It's all designed to afford this, this, this symbolic transcendence so that you have a capacity for grasping the significance of things. So see, think even of the fact that the significance of the animals being hunted is being grasped by the work of art. Just like we take it for granted, but no other creature, no other hominid is even doing this. What, it, what, what, it, what is your relationship to the woolly rhino such that you want to paint it on a cave wall? And this is not a, a, a gallery where you walk in, you go down a cave, you put your life at risk, you're in the dark, it's <laughs> terrifying. You open up in this in, inner world, it's in the dark, there's the flickering caves, this thing is moving, it's startling, it's real, it's not real. You have a different relationship to the woolly rhinoceros than other other beings have had to it. That's what I'm saying. There, this 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 capacity for religio uh -huh. and symbolic self transcendence, profound seeing into insight, seeing beyond, seeing through. This is what comes to the fore in the upper Paleolithic transition, and it seems to translate into the invention of music calendars and projectile weapons. Um, it, it, it transfers out and enables us to inhabit different kind of ecological ah. needs. Okay, yeah. Um, hmm. Essence, essence. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, the perception of the natural order, the perception of, um, Hmm, hold on. The ability to be in relationship with what is reality uh, from the point of view of let's call it for the moment, I'll just call it deep structure. Let's just put it that right. way. It's a little bit yeah. more simple, deep structure. Yes. You know, I actually like that better than essence. I think yeah. that's better. Yeah. I like, I like trying to make it simple so we don't get all janked up on things that are hard to understand in terms of their history. Deep structure. So we have like you can imagine like woolly mammoth. All right. The fuck is that? <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sen 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 sentience. Foreground. Foreground. Woolly yeah. mammoth. Yeah. All right. Let's 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 figure this shit out. Okay, how are we gonna do it? We're gonna have to go deep. All right. This is this is gonna require some some psychotechnologies, right? Yeah. It's gonna require that we we we, we do something and we notice like this is in some sense, we're discovering. There was a point at which there was a discovering an ordinary sort of 
ordinary evolutionary dynamic of exploring the possibilities of the, of the being of the organism. And there's this kind of like chipping away at the, the affordances of a heightened relationship of this density of sapience and this capacity to delve into the deeper structure and to notice things that are happening in some fashion, in some way, right? To become, what do you call it? Confirmation of contact? To achieve a confirmation continuity, of contact. Continuity, continuity of contact. Oh, even better. Continuity of contact. You know, to pour oneself into the shape of the deep structure and thereby to be able to realize possibilities that are otherwise not even vaguely manifest and to come pulling out of that new capacities. Like, ah, woolly mammoth, surround, spear, fire. I noticed that. If we do that, easier hunting, like simple to begin with. But then of course you see that that becomes, that becomes the niche. That becomes the thing as you begin to get better sensitivity and the deepness is quite nice, right? We need to learn how to explore that thing. Everybody who explores that thing does better than everybody who doesn't explore that thing. Let's focus mm -hmm. on sapience qua sapience. Mm -hmm. How do we actually notice the reality of that thing, which brings us into tighter relationship with reality on itself. Let's get really good at that, right? That's your paleolithic transition. Right. Because the possibilities that open up become imaginal, not just perceptual. Yeah, that the woolly mammoth could be used as a way of organizing this group of people. It could take on a metaphorical significance. Levi Strauss once said that animals are not only good to eat, they're good to think with. Mm. That we can use right. we can use these taxonomic structures and we can metaphorically, this is Mithrin's idea, we can metaphorically transpose them into other domains. So you get the first figurines that could plausibly be called religious in which human and lion, for example, are integrated together. It's something like the idea that the lion isn't just a predator or an animal. There's something lion about humans and there's something human about lions. And there's a metaphorical, imaginal possibility there, not just a material perceptual possibility. Right, yeah, the, ima the imaginal becomes the niche. And that's, yes. that's what happens, that's what yes. happens. We become yes. capable through the use of imaginal. We become capable through the use of imaginal of extending into diverse niches. In fact, we become yes. increasingly dependent upon it. And we happen upon a set of techniques that enables us to deploy that faculty effectively. Yes. Then we hit upon a very specific thing. Well, let's take that as the niche. Yes. So. And here we are. Yes. Like that's, yes. that's a story that begins and now it ends like in Austin, June 23rd. End of story. <laughs> nice story. Good ending. Here's the end. Good beginning. Here's the end. What does that mean? Okay. That's nice. So right. we, we, we need to put ourselves individually and collectively into the state in which we are most powerfully activating the imaginal and its capacity to be integrated symbolically with sapience. We use the imaginal to open up possibility and then we apply sapience to see what's the significance of the possibilities that have been opened up by the imaginal. Okay, so what comes up for me right now is that I'm gonna make a distinction between sorcery and for the, moment, for the moment, I'll just say wisdom for the moment. There's something better, but that's what I'll hold right now. Wizard, wizard actually means wise one. Huh. So I'll make a distinction between sorcerer and wizard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which will make the, make the nerds very happy, but it'll maybe make them <laughs> very confused. But let's just stay with wisdom for now. And I don't know how mega fix, fits into this story. But what I mean by sorcery is something like weaponized um, psychotechnologies. This distinction exists in the ancient world. It's between sorcery and what's called theurgia. Oh, there we go. That sounds like the right word. Exactly. Theo, theurgia. Yeah, nice. Right. Which is participating in the work of the gods mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to manipulate them and, and use that to deceive and manipulate other people. Right. So we live right now in a deeply, in a world dominated by sorcery. Yes. Right. To, to oh, Oh, right. And the deep remembrance and recognition and recognition and acknowledgement of theurgia 
is a proper way of orienting ourselves in Austin to what we need for emergence. Exactly. Oh, exactly. that's beautiful. I can speak, by the way, very carefully to this because I have been a sorcerer in my life for a long time. I've suspected so. Yeah. Elon Musk is a sorcerer, quite clearly. Yes. But I am not. Now I'm endeavoring to rediscover and remember in myself theurgia. Yes. And sorcery gives birth to egregores of the kind that we don't like. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Theurgia gives birth to egregores, egregores of the proper kind, the kind that we do like. Yes, yes. And a big chunk of the problem we're dealing with, so now I'm sort of at a se separate place from the notion of emergence, but a very big chunk of the problem we're dealing with in the context of, say, the meta crisis is the running amok of the egregores that we don't like. Yes. The vast majority of agency right now is being commanded by machines that don't have, they have lots of intelligence and they actually have a tremendous amount of sentience, but they have no sapience and they mm -hmm. have pulled humans away from our sapience and we are running as agents of these machines in the world. Paperclip maximizers of different flavors, sometimes known as the the WHO or the DOD or the Department of Education or Exxon Mobil, right? These are institutions disconnected from the wholeness of wholeness and, and running amok, but also having capacity. I think it's very important. When I use egregore to describe them, I'm not kidding. I've really been thinking about this. Like they've evolved a capacity. Humans are their agents, but they have something like a real sentience. They have a real capacity on their own as independent agents in world that have the you know, sensitivity to pain, like a crab, maybe crab level intelligence, giant swarms of, of, of hyper crabs snipping away at reality, but with no sapience, unlike real crabs, no, no sapience. Yes, uh, I, again, I've been talking with Jonathan Pajot about this um, mm -hmm. uh, and the older language of spirit and that which breathes through things. Uh, spirit, spiritus, the wind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, um, and you know, we, we, we kept it around in metaphorical language of like team spirit, the idea that there is a flow within, uh, within the dynamics of distributed cognition that um, emerges, I'm using it as a verb here, emerges a collective intelligence that supersedes just the uh, added intelligence of the component player. So you get a kind of hyper agency. Mm -hmm. um and you know and i've been publishing work with dan chappy about the, the the scientists moving the rovers around to mars the hyper agency can include machines very much yeah. um but i i, I liked I, I the the idea that hmm this is so mythologically rich but that doesn't mean it's not pertinent the idea that what affords the emergence of these hyper agents that are detrimental, that are parasitic, perhaps, mm -hmm. on human beings is sorcery. And the thing that affords the hyper agents that um, actually help lift people up, if I can use the biblical language, um, is something like theurgia. I think that's a really interesting proposal. I want to explore it because, because we can't do without the hyper agents, because we need hyper agents to deal with hyper objects. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is a, one of the presuppositions of dialogos. Dialogos is how do I properly activate a, and access and accentuate uh, collective intelligence of distributed cognition in a way that nurtures human beings in their projects of self transcendence. What we've been talking about here. That's the proper role of dialogos. It has both the horizontal role of you and I creating the hyper agent or affording the emergence of the hyper agent, but it should also afford this tough transcendence of the participants within it. Um, the Lord lifts you up, right? That, that, that sort of mythology. And, and then you're, I, I wanna get at, okay, what is it? What is it? What's the difference? Like, what's the difference? What's the deep difference between, we, we given the superficial criterion criteria by which we can distinguish the sorcery from the theurgia, but what is it about it that explains the type of hyper agent that emerges? What's the difference? What's the difference? Because like what you proposed is really, really powerful because you can, instead of, well, these things just emerge, 
you, you said, no, 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 I've got a proposition for you. I've got a proposal here. We can, we can influence not, not whether or not there are hyper agents. That is going to happen because we're cultural beings, blah, 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 blah. But we can influence the kind of hyper agent that emerges depending on whether or not we're practicing sorcery or theurgia. That is a new proposal. Mm -hmm. And that then brings up the crucial question. Yes, yes, excellent. And we've got this intuitive distinction, but what's the deep distinction that we could really point people to is, well, you, you did it a minute ago. You said, I was a sorcerer and I'm no longer a sorcerer. There was a fundamental, and you didn't mean, I used to wear red shirts and now I don't. It's not that kind of shift. This is a metanoia. That's what I heard you saying. A, bit, a, a meta, a beyond noesis, a beyond noticing, a conversion, right? What was that transformation? Open that up. What's happening when you decide, and I'm, all, I'm almost trying to probe you like Kierkegaard or Socrates. What's wow. happening when you decide to shift from sorcery to theurgy at a deep level yeah. that could influence the emergence of the good hyper agent as opposed to the bad hyper agent. I know that's a really demanding question, but it's the question that I think most properly emerges from what we're doing right here, right now. Well, it's 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 demanding as a question, but it's a tremendously more demanding answer. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the first move, so for me, the easiest way to do this is just literally first person, like you asked it in a, yeah, way, yeah, in a yeah. proper way. Yeah. Um, awareness, like literally at the level of sentience, awareness yeah, yeah. of a yeah. very particular problem, which got eventually got named. And naming things is helpful. Yes. It yes. wasn't named by me, by the way. It was named by somebody else. Lack of integrity. Mm. Now, initially, notice what this, this word actually has some very interesting valence to it, right? Lack of integrity in, 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 in a very particular sense shows up as like, doesn't keep his word, something like mm. that. Lack of integrity in a different sense is something like, like a wall that is, it doesn't have stable foundations. Mm -hmm. it won't, you can't depend on it. It won't actually do the thing that is presented as doing. It lacks logos. It lacks logos. It lacks fully, it's not fully integrated, right? Integration. Yes. It lacks yes. wholeness of self in relationship to both essence and purpose. And it's not fit to purpose. Well, how do you get out of integrity? Well, as it turns out, by the way, a little bit out of a, Short shortcut, uh, these, these words, sapience, sentience, intelligence, you have lost connection to groundedness in your own sapience and are operating almost entirely at the level of sentience and intelligence. Mm. Disconnection, discontinuity with self, discontinuity with wholeness of self. You're not a whole self. You are not well integrated. You're, all the aspects of yourself are not present in, in the way you're showing up in the moment. Certain aspects of self have been foregrounded and other aspects of self have been backgrounded or put into shadow to use a union notion. Yes, yes. It's, it's all kinds of havoc because they are parts of yourself, but because they're in shadow, there's two things. One is you often don't even notice they're showing up. And two is they get very agitated that they're not being perceived as part of wholeness of self. So they start creating havoc in ways that you don't know about. So this is why you show up as not being able to keep your word. This is why you show up as, as acting in a way that is not clearly um, able to be something stable. Okay, so it's put to me, I'm out of integrity. And for whatever reason, and this is a deeper question, for whatever reason, at that point, at that moment in my life, I could not but move fully into coming into integrity. I was able to make a commitment to myself and not a word commitment, but a, a deep commitment that that was what had to happen. At that point, you're fucked. <laughs> you're on a road, you're on a journey. And it's a very unpleasant journey, I can tell you that. Um, because all the infrastructure of life, which is going to be all the characteristics of persona, all the artifacts of identity, all the relationships that are built upon those personas and identities, and all the um, like, uh, call it tools of success, like whatever it happens to be, structures of power, the artifacts that intelligence knows how to use well, are now no longer necessarily valid. They may not all go away, but they're in question. Because as you move into integrity, you're shifting things that are at the deepest level, the level of, of, of sapience, the level of connectivity to the whole, right? Things that are deeper and broader and older than yourself to reality itself. Now, of course, you have to do that if you want to be in right relationship with reality. If you want to be able to make just fucking effective choices at all in life and orient towards what's most meaningful. You know, this is the reason why it's the right thing to do. 
Otherwise, you're going to end up dying and going, fuck, wow, got a whole big pile of stuff, but I didn't actually live vaguely meaningfully. You bring me food? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's nice. So we have one here? Sure, I'm talking to John, and we're going to be sharing this with the people at the Emergent Conference who want to watch. Uh, Vanessa just walked in, speaking of, by the way, of life story and, and the relationship between meaningfulness. So there's a good news. There's good news when you commit to integrity. Bad news, it's going to fuck shit up. Good news. As you get better at it, you'll actually be making more meaningful choices and you'll be living life more wholesomely. There'll be more wholesomeness in your life. Hmm. So this, and this is a compliment. This isn't filing you into some slot. This is Plato's answer. Hmm. Plato's answer is when the parts of the psyche are, do not have inner justice, when they're not in harmony, hmm. that is what causes your salience landscaping to find the wrong thing salient. Mm, nice. Wow. That's so inner conflict drives self-deception. Mm. And then and then of course you you see the world improperly and that reinforces the inner conflict because you're not properly addressing uh. the needs of the psyche. But if you start to align the parts of the psyche so that they are properly proportioned, there's the rationality. Mm. They are mm. properly proportioned where you know your appetites are dealing with sentience and your intelligence is dealing with honor and shame, and your sapience is dealing with truth and reality, and they're each properly proportioned in their really. So as they're properly proportioned, they start to, instead of working against each other, they start to work with each other. So your self-deception starts to go down because they stop interfering with each other's distribution of salience. You start to now see more clearly into reality. As you start to see more clearly into reality, you can more appropriately feed the psyche with the truth of how things are. And so it gets better at anticipating and understanding the world. And this is the reciprocal opening. This is anagoge. And Plato's claim is you will find that happy because you have two meta desires. In addition to the satisfaction of your desires, you want whatever satisfaction satisfies your desires to leave you in your peace. And in addition to whatever satisfies your desires, you want what satisfies your desires to be real rather than fraudulent or inauthentic. And both of those fail when you die at the end of your life with all of your shit. And you say, but wait, what was, I didn't understand. I obviously didn't understand, right? Uh, I, I didn't really see what was going on and mm -hmm. I'm not at peace with myself. And I, I put it to you that, I think Plato is right that when, and, and, and Socrates is the figure that does the aporia, that makes you realize I'm disintegrated and my, re, my perception of reality is distorting, distorted. And these two things are accelerating each other in a vicious cycle. And you, something, something was Socratic for you, I, pro, I put it to you, that hmm. caused the aporia. So the call to integrity comes up and then the call to integrity starts to clear up, right? You get the prop, remember what I, what I proposed to you, the proper relationship between appearance and reality. You can properly see through appearance into reality, the hermeneutics of beauty rather than the hermeneutics of suspense. And you're pursuing love rather than power. You're in the being mode rather than the having mode. There's all kind. there's many different people convert, converging on this idea, but I, I put it to you, and I mean this as a compliment, that you're actually proposing Plato's answer, that that's fundamentally what sapience is. Sapience is coming into a proper integrity that allows me to see deeply into reality. That, by the way, is theoria. Theoria, seeing the gods, seeing into the depths, where we get our word theory from. And then I can properly embody that, internalize that, and that's theurgia rather than sorcery mm -hmm. that's what i that's the whole neoplatonic tradition and i'm not trying to be anachronistic i'm not saying we can go back to it but i'm saying it's i think it's amazing that you converged on something that i have, I, I take very very seriously mm -hmm. and i think you did it mm -hmm. without uh, intending to end up there which makes it much more plausible for me i know in fact i can tell you this i avoided it as much as possible <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean i didn't i didn't um it was not a uh it's very practical, to be perfectly honest. As I'm thinking about it, I'm remembering that I, my, my, my mind, my intelligence, that sort of scene from uh, Sherlock Holmes. Yes, yeah. 
peering into the meta crisis and is perceiving the meta crisis and simply peering into it. And it kept going down the paths and noticed that each path was extinction. And it tried yeah. a lot of different paths and it went through like that scene from uh, Dr. Strange in uh, the Avengers. Yeah, 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 yeah. For, for, for the better part of like a year and a half, like deeply, deeply, like eight, 10 hours a day, like full committed contemplation and every path was extinction. And then it discovered something that there was something very specific that the, there was the wrong tool. It noticed that it was the wrong tool. Yes. And that was an ever so slight orientation to there's a different thing, which we, you know, all the stuff you were just talking about, that is the only possible way to address the meta crisis. Okay. Yes. And then, you know, then the, because it was so clear for me, clarity, because it was so clear that there is no other path. When the new path, when the path that is a plausible path, and this is Sherlock Holmes again, and when no other explanation is possible, the one left, one left has got to be the right one. Even though this other path is real squishy, tricky, hard, painful, unpleasant, the only path. So you got to be on it. Okay, what's it look like? Step one, integrity. Integrity first blush for me felt like just the ordinary meaning, but then I began to learn integration. Right? Yes. Now this is a whole yes. journey of integration. All, finding all yes. the aspects of wholeness of self and all the janky stuff inside that's all been sort of thrown out of whack over, you know, individually 50 or in this case, 42 years of havoc and, you know, 30,000 years of cultural havoc um, and finding them and saying, okay, time to bring these back into proper location. All relationships was as individual integration starts to happen, relational integration starts to happen. Each relationship has to come into right relationship. Right. And, and that creates a cascade effect. Each relationship is now forced into its own journey of integrity or not able to be in relationship. So it creates a very interesting meta dynamic. So there's something about an as above, so below. You know, something like the resolution to the meta crisis is, in some sense, just the path of theurgia. Um, yes. The, the proper proportioning of the psyche leads to the proper proportioning of attention uh, would yeah, lead yeah. to the proper actualization of the relevant hyper agents in relationship to the hyper objects. This is theurgia. Yeah. At there least even in modern language. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's critical that distinction, right? Because we, if we're operating from the mode of sorcery, we can get, Ooh, message for some of the folks who are going to be at that event we can grasp in our mind some of the computational characteristics we need to design i don't know really smart ais that have the capacity in the intelligence domain to computationally manage the complexity of a hyper object mm -hmm. we're, cl we're close we're also absolutely wrong like worst case bad case scenario if they're not coming from the space of theurgia then we're actually creating more trouble I think there's that's a very real possibility, and this is an argument I've made elsewhere. We are concentrating so hard on artificial intelligence. We are not doing much for artificial rationality, artificial sapience. We are not doing that. And we already know from the, from the work on human beings, intelligence is only weakly predictive of rationality, about 0.3%. And it's even less so predictive of that capacity for rationality to self transcend itself that we call wisdom. And so the relationship, so intelligence only weakly predicts rationality and then rationality has a recursive relationship to wisdom. So it very, very weakly pr predicts wisdom. And so making artificial intelligence is a very dangerous thing right now because we are not shifting our focus enough on making artificial rationality and affording artificial wisdom. And nice. here's the thing, here's the thing. We can use ourselves as templates for making artificial intelligence, but we need a lot more people that are, are wise if we're gonna have templates for making artificial wisdom. Yeah. So there's a moral obligation on us to not go ahead until we catch up with how we are capable, like how, how wise we, are now of course that's a moral argument it's not a practical argument we're going to keep racing ahead regardless but wow. what it means is there's a significant moral imperative on us it's like you know what we should be doing we should be getting as many wise people as possible right now so that it becomes clearer and clearer what uh, the wisdom template looks like so there's a greater and greater chance that we'll, we, we will be giving wisdom to these machines and not just intelligence 
So because that would help us get theurgia rather than sorcery. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that come up there. One is let's say wisdom in general. So we should be orienting attention to the wise and yes. we should be orienting, orienting our lot, time and energy in ourselves towards a grow, growing our own capacity in the domain of yes. wisdom. And Zach's point about intergenerational cultivation of wisdom, yeah. not just the providing of information for situating oneself in the market. Right, massively. <laughs> and then the other one is if I contemplate this notion, this, this, this languaging, artificial intelligence makes sense. I can say that. It's a thing. In fact, in some sense, it's a perfectly functional thing. It's a good place. Intelligence, artificial, no problem. Our artificial wisdom is either an oxymoron or a koan. Yes. I would say the proper answer to that is something like wisdom <laughs> or more deeper, richer wisdom, which happens to also be in right relationship with machines. That's what I mean by we can't really understand it or generate it until we can exemplify it in a significant and reliable fashion. Yeah, I can say, by the way, I've, con I've had conversations about the, the runaway problem of AI. Yeah. And I know what the answer is. I don't know how to solve it, but at least I know what the right answer is. Uh, we have to turn off the engine of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And we have to turn off the engine of war. Yes. Now, it may seem like that's a very weird thing to say. Like, it may seem like, well, you just said two impossible things to solve one thing that seems much more possible. My proposition is those two are possible, and the other one without those two is impossible. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And it's basically game theoretic, oh. win-lose, race to the bottom in the domain of money, in the domain of power. We want to be very simple. Yeah. That's what I mean. When I say turn off the engine of capitalism, what I mean is game theoretic, race to the bottom in the domain of money. When I say war, I mean game theoretic, race to the bottom in the domain of power. Um, yes. And, yeah. and the reciprocal relationship with each other, the way they actually uh, ally. So Mammon and Mars, to be very specific. The egregores of Mammon, the egregores of Mars, they must be turned off. It's okay just turned off. And then the way, the proper way to respond to them is we need to invoke egregores that are theomergic? Theurgic. Say, spell it. Theurgia is T-H-E-U-R-G-I-A. So the adjective would be theurgic. Theurgic. Theurgic egregores that are hmm, by intent, by design, and wholesomely able to turn off Mammon and Mars. Yes. All right. Well formed problem. Not easy to do. That's 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 very much a good articulation and explication of what I'm trying to convey with the idea of stealing the culture. Mm. Mm hmm. Nice. All right, man. I think we uh, ran up to the end of your time. It may be a little over. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, it was perfect. This is good. See you soon. Take good care. Bye-bye.